Here we go. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to welcome you to the second CKR Fellowship Talk titled Speaking the Unspeakable, Intimations on the Meaning of Madness. Um, this talk forms part of Changing Same, an anthology of spirit, which is an ongoing research engagement that's concerned with the nature of reality and responds in part to a written piece by Viwe Joka, um, which is entitled Conversations with I and I. So I'm really pleased today um, to welcome um, Malik and Viwe. Um, I mean, of course, uh, I'm sure they, they need no introduction um, but Malik is a performer, researcher, and cultural organizer, and is a film editor who's based in Cape Town. Um, and Malik is a creative writer and visual artist, Musuke um, Kabeja, um, and his work centers around unearthing the sign design and how we ultimately infer significance onto the world. Um, I won't necessarily go through the full bios. I hope that's okay, Malik and viewer. Um, unless yeah. you want me to, um, but I think we can always make those available online. But yes, we are all excited um, and uh, to have you both here. Um, so I think, yeah, go for it. Here we go. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. I see some names and faces I know, and some unfamiliar ones as well. Iwe, thank you for coming. We love you. Um, yeah, so I guess to get straight into it, um, when uh, um, asked me to do the talk. I was I was quite reluctant uh, because I think the 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 ideas that uh, that I'm trying to express, the ideas that I would want to express, I don't think. I think of them as ideas that are inarticulable. Um, they are ideas that are inexpressible. They can't be expressed. Um, so it was a bit of a contradiction for me to get on a platform and start talking about it. Uh, but I guess let me let me maybe start with context about what the work is. I'll try and briefly explain. So the larger project is called um, Changing Same, an ontology of spirit. And um, it's uh, essentially a research project like uh, Nomusa mentioned, and uh, it's investigating the nature of reality. And it's making a proposal about the nature of the world and trying to bring that viewpoint, that world view to life through building uh, basically an archive, a growing archive that's made up of performances um, and uh, other archival material, edited, sourced material that's edited, um, music as well, uh, sound design. Um, there's an aspect of video art. So it's a very multidisciplinary engagement, but ultimately it's building an archive of all these different forms that bring these ideas to life. And uh, a very big component of the project, of the larger project is this methodology that I've been using called free space. Mm -hmm. And uh, free space, just to quickly take you through it, Free space is essentially, um, it's something that I developed uh, with uh, an, an organization called People's Education. And in its original conception, it's basically a, a pop-up intervention. Um, it's an open platform for 
interactive and spontaneous expression. Uh, and, you know, materials are designated, uh, musical instruments are provided, props, costumes, different tools to be used artistically. So it's kind of a free form, everything goes, do something kind of space. It's open to anything. But um, free space has developed into more than just like a, an intervention where people participate creatively. It's also uh, a set of philosophical principles and it's a pedagogic device because in the context of people's education, we used it around trying to teach art and other things in a secondary schooling context specifically. So yeah, that's kind of just the larger project. And then, so as I was saying, I don't like to deal much with words as far as um, trying to express these ideas. The project is specifically trying to use means other than words to put the ideas forward. There's, there's part of the project that does involve that. So there's a library of maximum everything, which is um, an archive again um, of uh, sound and video, which is made up of interviews, conversations, uh, musical performances, um, and different kinds of human encounters uh, that cut together in a particular way in short snippets, usually one minute snippets. These clips communicate one or other aspect of this viewpoint, this view of the world, this ontology of spirit, or this changing same reality. And so the name of the project is Changing Same Ontology of Spirit. Change it same, no? Change it same. Um, so anyway, yeah. So there's there's the the library of maximum everything, and then there's a written piece, which has been done by Biwe wrote this piece. It's called Conversations with I and I, and that supports the project. It's kind of a text that supports the project. So that and the library are the only two written components. Everything else is performance and all these other forms that I mentioned. So, yeah, and then the performance stuff, of course, includes this character. <laughs> it includes this character, Hypocrite, um, which is a character that it embodies uh, these principles, the principles of free space and the principles of a changing same reality. So, uh, hypocrite is driving this thing, but coming back to the title, speaking the unspeakable, that's kind of how we arrived here is that I was reluctant to do it because I can't speak the unspeakable, but I also find the challenge intriguing to see what I can maybe do with the speaking space. Uh, and that was part of also what motivated me to reach out to viewer to say, let's do something with words. So I guess we're doing more with words and exactly what we're doing, as far as I'm concerned, is speaking the unspeakable. Um, so yeah, I mean, I never really know <laughs> where to start with this business of speaking the unspeakable. I think um, a good entry point and perhaps the only real entry point uh, is uh, something called DMT. And uh, I think of DMT, which is a, a substance. Uh, I, I believe it, it, it uh, showed for diethyl tryptamine. And uh, it's a psychedelic, it's a chemical that's naturally occurring, but it's also produced chemically. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a chemical which you find in all living uh, entities, 
plants, trees, animals. Um, what's interesting about it, it exists in a human body and it's released in the human body uh, when we die. It's, it's released into the brain. So what it does to the brain is very much what happens naturally in the human body when we pass away, we pass on or we pass through, however you prefer to put it. So DMT, I like to put as my only real reference. So I'm, I'm not, like I said, writing an academic paper, which has, you know, your reference list with Foucault and um, my, in my bibliography, you find DMT. The book you have to read is a hit or two or three of DMT. So that's my reference. Among other psychedelic substances, but DMT I think is the most uh, specific one. It's really the reference. So that's the entry point. And as far as explaining what is the specific value of DMT as a reference? I really think it's a matter of determining the indispensable recompensation of what you think is And it has to be something specially, specially I saw this song. Is spoken in shin of his ally in a way. Impacted it is spoken in me cut it. It's cutting me, cutting me, cutting me, cutting. It's cutting, 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 it's that's the entry point. Um, that's where we enter from. Um, so I guess we, let's get to the, the second half of the title. So the first part is speaking the unspeakable. Intimations on the meaning of madness. I guess this refers to the fact that we want to discuss the idea of sanity or the idea of insanity and how it relates to this uh, question of the nature of reality or this changing same reality. So the issue of madness is, uh, I guess how I got started on this issue because I've been there before mm. intellectually on the issue of madness uh, and it for a while it preoccupied my mind around the beginning of, of these ideas I was thinking about it a lot but it kind of faded and recently in the past say three months uh, it's come back as something that's uh, at the forefront of my mind. And I think it's because of recent encounters that I had that had me thinking in that direction. So I had an experience, multiple experiences in a very short space of time. Um, uh, I had an encounter with uh, a guy on the street who, I mean, he, he completely lost his mind. He'd been on the street for some time. And, uh, you know, he, he's a guy, he's from Congo and he moved here some time back, more than 10 years back. He had a kid uh, with someone locally and, you know, things didn't go well. He ended up on the street, started taking drugs. And then, yeah, he's been estranged from his family for some time. I mean, he's kind of known around Cape Town and I've seen him before, but I'd never seen him in the neighborhood. Anyway, I encountered this guy. And I was walking my kid to school 
And uh, he was convinced, he was very clear that it was his kid, not mine. I was uh, trying to take his child away from him. So, I mean, I didn't make much of it initially, but you know, I kind of just dismissed it as a guy on the street. It's a bit funny in the head, but so we, we continued and the situation escalated. He got quite aggressive. He tried to grab the child, my son. And um, yeah, I mean, it, got, it became a fight and we had a tussle and the guy picked up a brick and he almost hit me with a brick, but he missed luckily. And at that point, um, I pushed him down and he backed away and from there kind of cooled down. I mean, I don't want to get into all the little details of it. But anyway, that was the one encounter. And uh, yeah, that was interesting because immediately when I encountered the guy and I spoke to Viewer about this, for me, it, it's just strange. But at the very first engagement, I felt connected to him. I could see something was weird about him. I, I didn't know. And he started to act a little bit crazy. And obviously I'm with my child. So, you know, there's that feeling of a threat, but at the same time, I felt strangely connected to him and I didn't understand why. I still don't really understand why, but anyway, that's the first encounter. About two, three weeks later, I traveled to Cameroon to, uh, to see my, well, to spend time with family, but also to see my grandfather who's staying there and he hasn't been so well he's been he's been sick and it's kind of old age stuff and um, yeah i mean I, to 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 put it kind of in a package in a simple you know he's there's he's got i mean although not clinically diagnosed but he seems to be dealing with what many old people go through which is you know the mind deteriorates and the one of the existing terms for it is dementia. Um, and dementia really is like, you know, they say when you cuckoo, they say you are demented. Demented, berserk. Cuckoo. So yeah, he's, he's going through that. And I mean, I, I won't get into the details around that either, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was an interesting experience for me. And I think it's something a lot of people go through with all the people in their life because it's also a natural process. Uh, in other words, it's a natural process to gradually move towards madness in, in some way. So that's the second encounter. And the third encounter was, I mean, the, the, the thing about the second one was that there was something very strangely familiar when I first encountered my grandfather and I greeted him after so long because the last time I saw him, he wasn't like this. His situation deteriorated very fast in a very short space of time. And um, so, yeah, when I encountered him, it was, uh, it was strange, but it was, strangely familiar, I guess. Uh, and, and it actually specifically reminded me of the guy on the street who wanted to take my kid away from me. Uh, although not in, it didn't have the same kind of aggressive energy, but it was there. Uh, and the, the third kind of encounter was sort of, in a way with myself, I was going over at the time while I was still there, I was editing the material of the performances that we shot uh, in Cape Town, the hypocrisy sessions, the performances by a hypocrite accompanied by an artist. I did one with Asha Gamez and I did one with Hilton Schilder. And then I did one by myself uh, at, at other radios, at the studio at other radios. But um, I was editing that material and uh, specifically the footage. And, uh, you know, that familiarity, the same thread, you know, came through. And uh, yeah, just spending time there and being in that environment. And it, it is my first time coming firsthand into contact with that kind of thing. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so it really had me thinking. So that's kind of how we got here. But um, I do think that there's a broader relevance the the subject of madness. Um, I guess my feeling was that there's something about inhabiting this character. Yeah. <laughs> there's something about inhabiting this character which uh, alludes to this thing. It invokes a sense of nonsense, uh, madness, chaos, whichever you know word you prefer. And uh, for me, this actually relates back to when I was initially thinking about madness and. One of the things that, that I was thinking was that uh, being aware of, of the reality, the nature of reality, the, the changing same reality which we want to describe, it kind of renders you mad. To be in tune with it, it renders you mad. And that was the idea. And this, it, it comes back to it comes back to it comes back to the duality of things basically part of part of our our painting that we're trying to put together of this reality part of it is the idea of a sort of uh, Reality is the playing out of a vibratory or a, an oscillation, because a vibration is like an oscillation, an oscillatory uh, kind of creative process. I think the best, the best way to explain that, what I mean by that is to read an excerpt actually. Um, okay, so I just want to read a quick excerpt. It's by a guy called Henry Reed. And it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's taken from a, a text about, you know, a very new age text about uh, how to manifest your psychic powers, but that's not relevant. This, this is talking <laughs> specifically about, uh, <laughs> it's talking about, <laughs> Duality. So at the beginning of creation, the one force began by manifesting itself in two ways, as a force of attraction and a force of repulsion, on and off, up and down, in and out, white and black, male and female. These are some of the variations on the motif of opposites. This is the basic dynamic of vibration, an oscillation between two opposing perspectives. Oscillation or vibration is the basis of energy. Electrical energy manifests in a similar manner with an oscillation between positive and negative poles. So yeah, there's a bit more. It goes into creativity, but that's the, that's the important bit. And so what, what it means is that, you know, everything up until now is just the playing out of this loop, right? this oscillation, which is a frequency, which is a vibration, a back and forth between here and there, in and out, right, as described. So, as I was saying, to be aware of this reality, you know, you, you, you're gonna be all over the place because you, you can't fix your consciousness in one place. You'll be jumping everywhere, you know, it's like, the moment, the moment you try and identify one thing, it's another thing. So there's no opportunity to even make something or anything, right? You're just, yeah. And so that's a kind of madness. That's a kind of madness. Um,
I guess also taking it back to psychedelics. I mean, you know, I don't know who here has uh, had much experience with psychedelics or seeing people on psychedelics. Uh, at least you maybe have a reference of it somewhere through TV or whatever it might be. But, you know, people on psychedelics are easily perceived as being, you know, crazy, you know, <laughs> with funky. I mean, I guess substances, that's why they call them mind altering. They do stuff to our consciousness, you know, they do stuff to our perception, our ability to. So, you know, you might think of it as a kind of temporary mental illness, right? Because you're not functioning the way your mind would typically function if it was straight. You know, they say when you're straight. Um, I think it's synonymous with, you know, being of sound mind. Um, yeah, so th there's, a, there's a quotation, um, there's a colleague of mine, uh, he's, he's an MC, his name is Biko, and I work with him a lot, and he's kind of like a fellow free spaces. He uses this methodology as well, and we've used it a lot together. And uh, yeah, he, 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 he's, he's, a, yeah he's, a, he's a comrade. So Biko MC, also known as Godobori, uh, he couldn't be here today, but yeah, I'm sure he'll be very happy to, to see the document. Um, but Anyway, so this is the line from Biko, and it's, it, it's very important. Absurdity is the raw material of the comedian, a farce. The normalization of the abnormal. It makes for derision. Half the time, he who knows better laughs faster. <laughs> Crazy people happen to laugh very fast. It will happen to him before he understands what it is. But it's funny. <laughs> so yeah, that's Biko. Um, and for me, that's, uh, I think, a, 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 a convenient moment to reintroduce uh, hypocrite into the thing. I think one way to make sense of, of the thing of madness or one of the ways that I'm trying to understand it is coming back to this character and specifically the dimension of it being a jester. Or I think maybe, I think a better term is actually a trickster, a trickster. Uh, because the trickster is more commonly used in the mythological sense of the, the arch archetypal figure of, of a, a clown or a jester or a trickster or a fool. Um, the jester, I think, is more associated with medieval times and, you know, the, the pranks. And, yeah, they're, they're, they're similar characters, but I think trickster might be more accurate. Um, So I, the, the trickster, the trickster is is interesting. The trickster appears in in myths, in uh, in in the social structure, and in the practices of cultures all over the world. Um, you you can find it wherever you go. It's more or less universal. You you find the trickster. You know the Khoisan have the, I think it's the, what's the name? The ka, the the Kagen, but the the other I name and. Say again, view. Kagen, yeah. The Kagen, yeah. The other name I know is just Tom, um, X A M. Yeah. That's kind of like an alternative name that I know. So that's the the a Khoisan iteration. Uh, the the Yoruba have uh, you know the the Eshu, the the trickster god, uh, who is a similar figure. Um, in you know people of Native America, specifically the Puebloan. Native Americans, they have a, a Pueblo clown, uh, which is kind of like a similar, 
very sacred character. So you find this all over the place. Um, and one way of making sense of, of that uh, commonality is, um, is Carl Jung. And Carl Jung talks about, the, he has this notion of the collective unconscious, which is essentially the, the soul of humanity. So what part of what makes up this collective unconscious are archetypes, what he calls archetypes. And uh, these archetypes are kind of like uh, symbols or, or psychological structures uh, that kind of are, are universal psychological structures that make up the consciousness or the unconsciousness of humanity. Uh, kind of almost biological level built into our psychology and how we function over the course of evolution, much like all the other functions of our biology that we've accumulated over time in response to our environment. And so the suggestion is that we have these archetypal themes, uh, figures operating uh, that mediate our experiences and our behavior. And um, yeah, so some of the examples are, there's the, there's the mother archetype, it's a very big one. You know, there's the, the hero archetype or the savior. And then there's the trickster. So the trickster is one of these archetypes. And yeah, from a, from a union perspective, that's one way to make sense of uh, this commonality that you find everywhere, the trickster. Um, one thing Jung did say, though, is that he felt like the trickster is kind of forgotten, a little bit forgotten in the modern context. So I wonder what that means for us here now. Uh, but uh, I would hope that the trickster is still alive. Uh, you know, so. Yeah. But just something about the, the, the kind of the, the archetypal figure of the trickster, just in terms of how uh, Jung theorized it. So the archetypal trickster is seen as a boundary crosser. He is a transliminal being. He's here and there at the same time, or he, he is in neither, on neither side, or is in, in both, or, or is only on the one side, or is only on the other side, but he's, he's still there. It's kind of like the Zen people who cross their legs. And you know, they, I don't know if you've seen, they put the one leg on top of the other leg. And then, so the one is the other, but it's the one, but it's the other. So anyway, so he's a transliminal being who crosses and often breaks both physical and societal rules. He violates the principles of social and natural order. He playfully disrupts normal life and then reestablishes it on a kind of, on a new basis. So he, he shifts, he shifts the line, he bends, he tweaks, he plays with the boundary. Often this bending and breaking of rules takes the form of tricks or thievery. Tricksters can be cunning or foolish or both. The trickster openly questions, disrupts and mocks authority. So I'm not perfectly sure, but I think the trickster comes in somewhere with this madness thing. And maybe part of his role, uh, because the trickster, the archetype, and the actual real life trickster that we experience in society, because the archetype comes through naturally, biologically, psychologically, uh, he must have a role and uh, maybe it has something to do with bringing us into contact, into contact with madness. Uh, yeah, it has something to do with bringing us into contact, back into contact with madness. So the, the thing about madness, I think 
to finish off. Um, the thing about madness or, or, or sanity and insanity uh, is that, so we, we can associate that duality, you know, sanity and insanity. We can associate that with another duality, which is order and chaos. And you, you might even look at sanity and insanity as uh, the kind of individual internal version of the same thing, right? Uh, insanity being disorder or chaos and, and sanity being order of the mind of the psychology. Uh, and of course, insanity, disorder, chaos, these sides of the duality have a negative connotation. Um, you know, we, we, these are things we avoid in our everyday life. You know, the, the, the way we use the language, it kind of speaks for itself. No one really wants to be insane. And you know, when you go insane, they lock you away and they hide you away. And, um, you know, chaos sounds like evil and death and darkness, you know? So um, there's that. And I'm, I'm finishing, this is your viewer. So to end off, let me, I wanna point out, and then just to tie it up, I, I wanna point out, there's a song. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's a very, it's a very popular song. Many of you will probably know it. If you don't, it will be very easy to find it. Uh, but it's a song by Zim Nawana, Able Follow. And it's a song about uh, Fort Bayford, which is an area in Eastern Cape. Uh, and it's known for being the place, kind of the place of the mentally ill because there's a big mental illness institution there and so a lot of the people from the eastern cape you know who they go there so it's got that association um but the what the in, why i want to bring the song is because paradoxically the song it talks about um, this place in a fond kind of longing way of wanting to return home to, to a place of happiness, a place of warmth, a place of family, this place of the mad, of the mentally ill. And so, you know, it's a bit of a, but I think in the context of, of the music and, and, and the energy of, of what uh, Brazim is putting through is, you know, this place of, of the mad, in Daoyama Gez, this place of the mad, is a nice place. It's not like, you know, it's not all those bad connotations. It's a nice place, good vibes. It's, uh, you know, it's chaos, but it's like a good chaos. It's a joyous chaos. You know, it's a frenzy of joy. You know, it's an ecstasy, uh, a togetherness in ecstasy. And that's, of course, what the music does. And that's, you know, that's the energy of it all. So I like that song. And I like what that song does because it's clearly talking about, <laughs> but in a very sweet, positive way, you know, it's sweet, funny. So, Yeah, yeah, so, you know, maybe, you know, he's playing a bit of a trickster role, we can say. The song is, is uh, inviting us to notice, to, to, to notice, to recognize, to grow with, to, uh, and, to, and to find splendor in the chaos, in a very, trickstery kind of way, you know, this thing that you're so scared of that's gonna 
fuck you up and destroy your life. And da, 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 da. You need it. You need it. It's the good shit. So, yeah. Yeah. If you will please come through. Uh, I'd like to pass it to you from here. I think this would be a good point for you to come in. Thanks, brother. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a lot. It's a lot of rich, a lot of richness, a um, lot, of, lot of fertile concepts. Um, and a lot of it is very, it moves, you know? A lot of what you said begs us to kind of move along with it. And I think how I want to start off is by saying everything happens in space and time. I repeat, everything happens in space and time. We happen in space and time. This meeting is happening in space and time. Everything, all things, all quantifiable, perceptible objects and subjects, everything that can be witnessed by the senses, touched, related with to, happens within the context of space and time, or in other words, embodiment. Um, why that is so important is because the feeling of existing is a feeling of being within these two qualities, time and space, you know? Um, matter of fact, these two qualities are so inextricably linked that one can perceive them as one quality manifesting in two ways. So we can, we can say space, time, we can say time and space, but for the purposes of the conversation, we say, let's, let's distinguish them just for a little um, space and time. And space and time correspond to rhythm and relation because what time is, is our perceptive ability to pay attention to the consistencies that occur within space. So when we are born, which we have no real immediate memory of, this space-time centering is what characterizes the moment of our, one could call it, arrival into this plane. So when Malik, um, when you approached me to write the piece, Changing Save, um, for me, what kind of fundamentally came to mind was this whole idea that the more things change, the more they stay the same. And maybe for some people that kind of feels like a, a bit of a tautology, you know, sounding deep without really saying anything. But for me, it's a very profound thing that speaks to space and time because how I understand it is our identity, our sense of who we are is something that recurs and happens as a result of the logical consistencies of the universe. Somehow we live in a universe that is rhythmic enough for us to come to grips and to pay attention to certain things that happen quite often. And what this regularity of time and space does is that it allows for us to slowly make sense of the world in terms of how things usually occur so that we start to have a prominent sense of the things that are more often likely to happen than the things that don't. And it is in this trajectory of things that happen often, regular things, typical things, um, that archetypes such as the spiral come about. Because we are the center that emerges again in space and time. And through this rhythmic pattern, 
we're able to kind of slowly pay attention and realize ourselves, the world around us, and everything that we relate to in space and time. And that's what many would call memory. We begin to, in our engagement with the world, kind of see this consistency or coherency that occurs in the universe. A day is like another day because the sun rises and it sets in that fundamental way. There are things that happen in every day that are different, but the reason we are fundamentally able to stay intact is because everything is coherent enough for us to do so. The universe is consistent enough for us to say, I'll see you tomorrow for the meeting at 12. How do we know? Because there's been so many tomorrows, there's been so many 12s that we logically assume that it is going to be the same even in the next round of the cycle. So the quality of existence is characterized by this regularity. And you find that this observation of regular occurrence is something that manifests itself in how cultures begin to understand the world. So because we have a sense of things happening often enough for us to grasp, that allows us to kind of learn more about the world. Because if I know and I pay attention to how the sun moves, at some point, I'll know at exactly which moment that it most often is tends to rise. And I'll be able to logically be able to relay that to others around me. And then before you know it, we have systems of how to outline day and night, how in the course of time, different seasons occur. There's moments that are colder than others where the plants don't yield as much. There's moments that are warmer. And so within this whole pattern, this consistency, this fundamental recurrence is what really characterizes life. Creatures, including ourselves, are able to go about their business, are able to kind of grow and evolve because of this dominant prevalent of consistent patterns within space and time, what, what many would call order. Now, what this does is that we become so secure in regularity. We become so secure in things happening as we most as they most likely tend to do. Uh, we watch the weather forecast and it says it's most likely going to rain tomorrow. Nine times out of 10, that's usually the case. You know, uh, We meet people and we get to know them and we get to know them so well that there's things about their personalities that we feel we can predict. But what we also begin to realize is that the world, the universe might be consistent enough for us to grasp and to live and to take this consistency and move from it and be able to kind of move through memory and store for next moments and phases to come. But there's always glitches of the unexpected. You know, there's always something within the regular day which surprises us. There's always something about people we think we know that shocks us every now and again. So there's a tendency within this regularity, within this order, for things to also move in tangents that we never expected. And I think it is this kind of tendency for things to move apart from how we usually expect them to go that many would characterize as insanity. Because when you look at the word say, it simply, etymologically speaking, it means healthy. Healthy, etymologically speaking, means hope. What does it mean when we say someone is whole? It means that their body and their mind is integral enough for them to consistently move and perform tasks and become a well-balanced person. So the measure of how we judge others is really according to this fundamental consistency. We always have a cult of consistency and we've ran away with this consistency to an extent that we have done it at the expense of the disorder that does happen and the disorder that happens in a way that startles us. And I think cultures that have paused to look at this quality of disorder 
have reaped very fertile fruits because they've been able to notice that in the very same way that I'm able to know who I am and who my parents were because I took in a history and a logic that happened through each and every day of my life, which was imparted in me, which allows me to have a, 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 a solid identity of who I am. If I were to attempt to go to the edge of my life, it kind of all evaporates into a moment I can't tell. I can't tell where I began. All I know is I'm here. And all I know is that I am living and I'm growing. And it's this tendency to not be able to tell where things begin, which is a very profound insight and something that a lot of, you know, wise men and women in the past have tried to examine. That how come so much logical consistency, so much order, when traced historically, seems to slip from our grasp? We find ourselves in this place where if we go deep into it, we truly can't tell where it starts. It almost shocks us into becoming. Um, and I think this shocking factor is something that's worth being explored because if we really look at how life and existence tends to flow and move, um, this quality of surprise is as important as the quality of consistency. This quality of being able to kind of have the rug pulled under you um, is how organisms within space and time are able to realize that the consistency is not so, con is not so consistent that the world in and of itself is fully governed by it. And that there's always going to be an element of chaos in the dynamic. And paying attention to this element of chaos allows us to see the diversity, allows us to see the variety in how things can happen. The things don't happen either this or that way, but even within the choices of this and that, there are minute, differences. There are minute variations of how everything happens. So going into this whole proverb of uh, when you go to a river and you witness and you look at it, you're never looking at the same river twice. Because if you go there and you go the next day, what you're actually seeing and witnessing is a moving stream. And what you call river is a process. It's not one thing that's just there all the time. It's actually a rivering, not a river. So even in the same way of that river being something we define as an object, but actually a process that's constantly happening, we are also something that can be seen as an object. I'm Viwe, you're Malik, and everybody else there is who they are. But we are actually developing, growing, constantly moving, changing things. So even though we feel the same, even though we're able to look and we look the same pretty much most of the time, you know, <laughs> um, there's difference that's constantly happening. This, the face I have today isn't really the face I have yesterday because I shed most of it on my pillow, you know, with the dead cells. You know how they say most of what we sweep up at home is actually dead cells, you know? So we're constantly decomposing, we're constantly breaking down as we're building up. So there's this aspect that's constant chaos happening very implicitly, but we see the constant order that happens very explicitly. So the importance of chaos is that it's there, but we kind of have to look very closer because we might just assume that everything is ordered. We might just assume that that one river is the same river every day and that although that's that same drop of water. And when we do that, then we are actually um, severing ourselves from understanding how change moves. We're actually living in the static world where we don't realize that aging, moving, 
time. All of this is a part of this chaotic implicitness, which happens beneath this kind of orderly explicitness that we're able to visibly identify. So again, this orderliness happens in a way that we can see, but it's really being driven by a disorderliness that we can't see unless we look very closely into the way things move because the order moves in such a way that we're able to see the breakdown of things as they happen. We're able to see people grow old. We're able to see uh, things rot. We're able to see time move. And because we're able to kind of conceive change as it happens, we are able to make the logical conclusion that as orderly and as consistent as things are, they're changing. They're growing towards something many would call death. They're growing towards an end. Everything is growing towards complete annihilation. And I think for certain cultures that created a, a compulsive fear where they responded to that by trying to resist death, by trying to resist the transition that happens all by itself, spontaneously, somehow. We're just constantly shifting and moving, changing, decomposing. And again, this cult of order is exactly that. This cult of consistency is our inability to be able to make peace with, embrace, and even look forward to dying. Because what dying implies, it implies us kind of returning back to this very same unknowable evaporating that we try to go back to when we try to pinpoint where we start. And for many sages, the logical assumption, conclusion for them was in the very same way that before we are born, there is nothing. And after we, uh, we die, there is nothing. This nothingness, this thing beyond space and time must be this profound essence that actually allows for all things to happen in space and time. So now, the cult of order. The cult of order rejects the notion that beneath everything we see in space and time is a nothingness. And this nothingness or how you perceive nothingness is kind of very important to the feeling of what you feel because we become so attached by object, time, and space that we feel that the quality of all existence can be reduced down to objects. And so our words, our language, are ways in which we symbolically represent these, the world around us, the objects around us. And if we talk about the ultimate essence of where these things may come from, may emanate from, to define that as an object, to go that beyond space and time is a thing, is to create another aspect of space and time, which kind of creates this rut where you're stuck into an infinite regress where if you say something made everything, then what made that thing? And then you're stuck into this counting of logic because you refuse to say nothing created everything. Because if nothing created everything, then it's out of the bounds of space and time. It's transcendent. It's the unspeakable. It's, it's something that cannot be comprehended and consistently and logically defined. It's insane. It's mad to even think of the notion that everything around us comes from no thing. Or to put it in a sit closer, to say, yon kinto isuka. And when, you know, kwindo ngaso yito. Because even in the idea of Indo, 
we find that it's more etymologically related to to, ukuti, ukuta, which means to name, to assign. So when we say a thing, we are, we are simply referring to this kind of logical definition of things as we witness them in space and time. So if we try to reduce infinity to something definite, we are in other words, trying to impose the logical consistency into every aspect of life. And we are doing that at the expense of the chaos, at the expense of the disorder, at the expense of the diversity that we know exists. And this is why for cultures who hold fast to the idea that we must come from something which has some idea of what it is doing, Chaos is a difficult thing to grasp. But on the other hand, for cultures which make room for this chaos element, for the unexpected, for this um, strange attractor, which also seems to steal things in ways that we can't constantly define all the time. This brings about the element of that which will, in the same way that we look forward to the things that we know are likely to happen, there are things that we know are most likely to shock us. That thing that we do not know how it will unfold, but it will unfold in you. So I think in, in, in kind of um, talking to what you said earlier on about this archetype of the trickster, this archetype of this element which introduces chaos. Um, this is what cultures who saw this element of unpredictability also as part of this balance of the universe, when not all things can be consistently and logically defined accurately, are able to then make room for the unexpected. And making room for the unexpected is being able to make room for the illogical, for the incoherent. So when people are around in cultures that made room for chaos, displayed behaviors, actions which were out of the regular pattern, out of the norm, out of the typical. They were able to look into that and say, that's the energy of chaos. That's divine. As divine as the thing that we are able to predict, the unpredictable is also a quality of the divine. So I think that's a very radical difference from cultures who again have this cult of order because a cult of order cannot embrace the illogical. So a cult of order will take people who display actions and behaviors that are out of our norms and they will try to detain them in spaces where they attempt to kind of bring them back to this coherence. So now you enter into the culture of the mental institution, the asylum, this idea that the mind is a very rigid and logical thing that we all should abide to. And that whenever someone displays qualities that are out of typical regular behavior and actions, they've lost that. They've lost that quality. They are out of their mind. They are out of the predictable element. So if we really examine that, we find that it isn't necessarily that there is anything wrong with the person. I think. I think our definitions of what we consider right within the context of this cult of order, right means that which fits neatly into the typical, which is coherent enough for us to grasp. So if you are unpredictable, you're wrong. You have to be predictable. I have to know what you're doing or how, or how you're likely to do things. Because if you then do things in ways that I haven't seen and heard and I'm not used to, then I don't know how to deal with you. And if I don't know what to deal with you, how to deal with you, I don't know what to do with you, you know? And this is the kind of uh, thought that goes into the cult of order. When disorder happens, it says, what can we do with this? Because the cult of order looks at all things as 
elements to be possessed for the benefit and purpose of the culture. So it's a culture which seeks to grasp things within its hold. And it is not comfortable with the fact that there are things that can be out of our grasp. There are things which cannot be spoken. There are actions which cannot be comprehended. There are things which cannot be anticipated. So for instance, if we look at what we went through with uh, the COVID pandemic, that was disorder manifesting itself as something that none of us could have perceived. And it taught us, or at least it forced us to deal with disorder, to deal with the unexpected, to deal with chaos, to deal with this um, quality of things annihilating themselves, to deal with the fact that things break down as much as they build up. So I think if there's anything we've learned from what we've been through is that as much as the world and our security in the world is founded upon our ability to be able to consistently move and coherently be around things as they logically happen, there's an element that we should make room for, for the unexpected because it happens constantly and it also happens as the expected happens. So again, everything happens within space and time. So within space and time, this embodiment, umzimba or umzi, Yeah. Here you go. Oh, you're back. Oh. I'm back. That's the unexpected. <laughs> come, come through, come through, come through. Yes. Um, so again, to be able to adapt and adjust to the unexpected, to be able to realize that that which we cannot grasp, we cannot understand, happens in the same breath as that which we can. And so with conversations between I and I, that's what I try to do. And I think with language, there's an interesting thing where you kind of get to the tip of what is logically possible to put into words. Um, and I think that edge of what's logically possible, that tip is what many call poetry. Um, because poetry alludes to things. It doesn't directly point at them. It refers to things that we feel implicitly without explicitly saying, uh, there it is. Um, and I think this is practically the only way that words can touch the untouchable is by alluding to them, is by suggesting, because really it comes as a suggestion, even to us. We, we grow and we live and before we know, we feel, you know? and as we learn to put things in words, you know, it is said that um, thought is how we talk to ourselves and communication is how we talk to others. When we learn this kind of symbolic tool and we make these mouth noises that capture ideas and that are structured in this um, dimension of concepts that we've been able to define within the scope of what we know, and we call that language and within this language, is embedded all our views and our understandings of life so far, then that means the possibilities of what we can do happens within the context of this language. But it doesn't stay rigid because again, it's, it, it's an expanding limit, you know? It expands as we grow. But what it implies is that there's something which cannot be embodied, something which cannot be defined, something which cannot be comprehended, something which cannot be consistent. And for many, this is God. For many, this is the divine. So you find that in many traditions, when people express actions that cannot be defined, when people, you know, somebody decides to go stick their foot in a pot of food 
and they scream and they start chanting illegible words. You know, it creates that spontaneous glitch where we don't know what to do. Um, but cultures that have made, made room for disorder have said, that's the divine speaking to us. And if that's the divine speaking to us in terms which we cannot understand, then what we need to do is slowly work at being in touch with something beyond words. And this is where traditions of meditation express themselves from, that there's more to life than that which can be perceived. All that can be perceived happens from the fertile power of that which can't be perceived. And it's implicit, it's right in us. It's like knowing that you, you have a heart even though you haven't taken a look at it yourself. You just feel it, you feel it beating, you feel it moving um, and you don't need to cut yourself up because the moment you did, you would be able to witness it, you know? So I, I, it, again, it's that kind of knowing something on, on, on knowing that there's a, a quality uh, uh, or a no thing, you know, symbolically speaking, active, which manifests the things that you can perceive. And this is what cultures that made room for disorder have done. Then they see, well, if this consistency is characterized by us engaging with the world and moving with it and learning, then maybe we can kind of learn how to also adjust to the unexpected and the inconsistency and the chaos by not doing anything, by just sitting or standing, whatever it is, just allowing yourself to not be in the action, but to just be. And that, that in that being, you we kind of access quote unquote, the inaccessible. We feel it even though we're not able to grasp it. And us feeling it is knowing that we can rest on the fact that there is nothing because, when, because we then conceptualize nothing, no thing as a very fertile element, as something that See what I did there? Something. And that's what words do because now you kind of have to refer and conceptualize no thing as thing. And that's what poetry does. And that's where contradiction takes place, you know? And that's where this whole splitting of the seams happens, you know? So I think what we call insanity and the many ways in which uh, people express themselves that we have come to factor as mental illness, mental instability are valid expressions that happen from within the context of the unexpected, the disorderly. Um, and it is how we deal with disorder, which determines how we can effectively live in, in order. So if we try to turn everything into order, then we fight the fact that disorder lives and thrives. Um, if we fight the fact that having a nine to five job uh, each and every single day of our lives is, is, you know, well, at least five days of the seven day week for the most part is bound to exhaust us. And if you couple that with the fact that in every life there's relationships that are tough and engaging for people to go through, that at some point it's natural, it's natural for each and every one of us to feel like breaking down. And the breakdown is something that we can in fact start to look forward to because there's nothing wrong with this. We, we're simply being natural to being called by the disorderly aspect of life, which says it's time to be still. It's time to be in a place where your agency is not subjected to any aims or goals or directives, but you are able to value life in and of itself. And I think that's what we lack in today's culture. We do not value life in and of itself. We value life for what we can get from it. We value life for what we can amass. And it's this cult of, of, of order, which kind of expresses that. 
And so Conversations Between I and I as a piece examines that. It examines this whole um, logical fallacy of trying to conceptualize the world exclusively as order, something that you know Newtonian physics fell victim to. And even within science, they, you know, the latest research was able to realize that beneath the atoms and the structure of things that we are able to see express themselves orderly is a disorder, is something that escapes microscopes, is something that we can only refer to as dark energy because God damn it, it's, it's an inconceivable fertility. And so I think whether you're looking at the modern trends of science, of, of logic, of reason, of religion, this conclusion that the depths cannot be grasped is something that we're all beginning to realize. And I think um, cultures that want to be healthy, cultures that want to define health, define being whole in the context of now being in a balance of disorder and order, knowing how to adjust to both the unexpected and the expected, open themselves up to new ways of looking at things, you know? So, because a lot of our traditions of how we cope with the disorder are still traditions that are mournful of the fact that we cannot have things last and go our way consistently. When we go to funerals, for the most part, the instinct is to resent death because we feel there's something we have lost. When we live, the obsessive notion is now to keep things. And the moment we lose touch, lose grasp of, and lose anything, we feel like that's our life going down the drain. Um, and I think what the piece attempts to do is to question that, to say, if disorder happens as naturally as order, then it's a clear implicit sign that as we have learned how to predict through understanding the logical coherency of life, we can also learn how to adjust by understanding the incoherency of life. And it is that balance which keeps everything together. The shock and the absorption thereof, you know, the, the balance and the tilting and the falling. Now we don't mock. Now we embrace the, the character of the trickster who causes disorder to happen, the troublemaker, you know. So now we understand that life is not a thing to be solved and that the challenges that occur to us aren't necessarily quote unquote problems. Because again, this notion that there are problems is this notion that there are things which should not happen. There are things which should not happen within outside the context of what we expect, outside the context of what we logically can perceive and can anticipate. So um, for me, as I perceive it, even this relation with DMT, the diametral tryptamine, um, it's this mysterious quality of how there are plants that have the same chemical composition as something in us, which allows for an expression to happen when we ingest these plants to bring us out of space and time in its normal context. That there is something that invites disorder naturally embedded in us because in disorder, there is healing. So I think cultures that make room for disorder make room for that healing. So it brings me also to this tradition of Bungo, the tradition of, you know, some would say the shaman. These are traditions which are characterized by a lot of a violent, spontaneous bursts of unexpected movement. These are culture, these are traditions which are kind of characterized by not knowing what is going to happen next and embracing those unpredictable steps as ancestrally ordained movements and saying that even within rhythm, there is a kind of 
um, manifestation of spasm. There is a, a, a breaking which goes with the bonding. There is a disorder which goes with the order. So then we're able to look forward or at least anticipate the disorder and not reject it when it happens. So I think that, the, that that's the real big idea. Here. It's the fact that um, the people we call crazy are actually people who have dived into disorder. And the loss of mind is an inevitable quality that is part of being in the context of a world which can and is most likely to exhaust us. Um, even without even trying, as we grow older, like you know, you were alluding to your grandfather, this just happens by itself. We lose aspects of ourselves. And if if our identity is fundamentally characterized by order, we we do not access the blessings of disorder. We do not access the potential awakening, the potential realization that happens when we also understand that disorder, death, the unexpected incoherency, um, insanity, madness is a natural part of life. And that uh, people who display these qualities are better dealt with in ways that embrace that one, there isn't anything fundamentally wrong with them. And two, if they're able to coexist with us in any way, it's more our benefit than theirs. Um, because the emphasis is always on trying to return people back to normalcy in trying to kind of bring them back to logical order as it were. And if that's possible, fine. But if it isn't, then also it's beautiful because that person is, that person is, that person is in a place that is as valid as powerful and as divine as the plane you're in. So, I mean, I, 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 I live in the townships and, you know, because of the fact that we have been, the townships in and of themselves are spaces that we were imposed into. Um, and the practice of indigenous ways in which we dealt with disorder aren't always accessible to us. It's more common to see, quote unquote, insane people just moving around and being part of the existential furniture. And everybody knows that's the that's the guy right there. He's, you know, he's not quite there, but he's also valid. He's present. You know, she's not quite as present as everybody is, but their existence matters. And how we interact with them, if they come close to us, anything that they do comes from a divine place. These are not people to be afraid of. These are not people who kind of display something that you should be severely rejecting. I mean, of course, if anybody tries to harm you, the logical thing to do is to try and protect yourself. But that does not, that's not a quality that exclusively belongs to people who have lost their minds. You know what I mean? You know, there are many motivations for people to try and harm people. So I think when we try to, to attach nefarious or sinister qualities on disorder or madness, and we always try, you know, the, like the whole cliche of the mad scientist and how in, the, in, in pop culture, the villain is always somebody who's kind of lost it a little bit. And what that does is that it creates the assumption that in, you know, in, in, in the people we label mad are the people who are most likely to harm us, uh, who are most likely to have ill will towards us, uh, who most likely have um, feelings that are not things that the world can embrace. So these, these ideas, this, I, this, this cult of order also tells us what is to be embraced and what not to be embraced. And for the most of classical history, um, this idea of the mad person is a reject, is a villain, you know, it's the devil. Um, and that's how, with that kind of a mindset, we're able to look at traditions like Ubumoma and we're able to say that's demonic, that's insanity. These people are going through something that should be straightened out. So it's this obsession with 
life as logical, you know, things as narrow, clear cut, consistent, which creates this conflict with not being able to cope with this inevitable disorder of life, which happens. Um, so from my side, that's how I approached the piece um, as I wrote it. That's what I feel is important in Malik's work is that um, you explore the inherent surprise that lies dormant in all of us. Um, and you bring about the constant question of what do we do with disorder? How do we handle things that are unexpected? You know, what do we do when, when someone displays actions that do not follow the logical uh, tropes of what we're used to? If someone comes to me and, uh, you know, hands me a banana and says, please take care of my child, I'm coming back. How do we deal with that? You know, um, and I think making room for disorder is looking at that playfully instead of looking at that with fear. Um, and that's what speaking the unspeakable is too. It's playing with the idea of being able to explain the inexplicable by kind of alluding to it. So we then kind of, we have an attitude that plays with disorder because we understand that disorder is not something that seeks to, um, that's something to be rejected. You know, it's something that is inevitably happening in and around everything. And as a result is an inherent quality in everything. And we're able to embrace the madness, embrace the disorder and uh, take care of that banana until that guy comes back, you know? Yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, Malik, Viewe, thank you so much. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, um, an important point, probably a lesson for us, I was about to say, it's open to Q&A. But again, we often have to be aware of how we also reinforce the cult of consistency. But I think we just open up the space for just hearing um, and hearing what resonates with um, both your contributions. I saw a hand go up um, and now I do, I'm not sure if I can see it anymore, but please speak um, whenever you feel like speaking. Also, it doesn't resonate. It doesn't have to resonate. Eh? Does it have to resonate? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't In have fact, to... we're, we're, we're more excited for the critics, the critics you know, the, those are the, the juicy ones. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think it was, was it Saneli Siwe? I'm not sure if you wanted to, to come in, please do feel free. Um, I wanted to ask, um, okay, I didn't really want to, well, okay, there's a lot going on in my head at the same time, just taking in everything everyone said, um, but I wanted to ask, is there then an inherent relationship between disorder and order? Well, you guys have alluded to that, and can one not necessarily be the makings of the, uh, of the next, because, and I ask this because the way I see it, um, is based in like from a lot of the different religious and cultural perspectives that I've kind of witnessed where chaos and disorder are kind of um, pit, up, pit against each other, you know? Um, like for instance, in Christianity, it would be the symbol of order being Jesus, let's say, which is hilarious to me because there's a lot of disorder there also. Um, and the symbol of chaos and disorder, or rather God, and then the symbol of chaos and disorder being the devil um, or Lucifer or whatever, and how they, they're set up as if they're polar opposites of one, of, of one thing, when in actual fact, I believe that, or I've come to believe that all things are, are a part of all of it, you know, like how Uvio was saying, when you ingest this plant that makes you go on said trip, that kind of opens up all of these um, possibilities of being um, to you or rather makes you aware of them because they always were. And then you come out of it on the, on the other side, um, different, you know, um, but still the same. Um, that's because it speaks to something that is in you, 
you know, that already exists. And I think the the cult of, what did you guys call it? The cult of... The cult uh, of order. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I think the cult of order, um, wh what it does is that it, it, it kind of, it sets things apart that, that I don't believe should be, you know? Um, I think all of us have a little madness in us, just like all of us have a little like sanity Nazi in us, you know? And the things in which we are comfortable to, to roam in the insanity with, we often have things on the polar end where they make us so uncomfortable that we feel like if we were to engage with them, we may, we may lose more than we, like more of our ability to ground ourselves in, in space and time, you know? Um, and I've just always thought that, I've just always thought that interesting, that actually what is seen as, as quote unquote madness or insanity is, is, is the freedom to be able to roam in the place of nothing with no need to stay grounded in space and time because even they themselves are concepts that were created to kind of make sense of what already was. So what already was, was chaos, you know, um, the difference between wilderness and, and like, I'm, I've lost, I've lost the word, but like the difference between things being wild in and of themselves and things kind of um, being, I don't know, like if, when I look at it, I look at it from, from a nature place, like nature comes and happens with order, but it also, or there, rather there's, a, there's an order to the chaos, right? But then the moment the chaos is removed, the order cannot stand. And the moment the order um, that naturally happens is removed, the chaos cannot have a place to play, you know? So it, it just feels, yeah, <laughs> I think that's my, that's my contribution for now. I hope it makes sense to everyone. And if we could speak around it, maybe I'll come back and we can have some more chats. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Frida, and then maybe we have responses from Malik and Vera. Hello. Hello, thank you. Um, so what I, I mean, sorry, I got a misunderstanding of time, so I could only see the last part or like listen to the last part of your talk. So it might be very far fetched. But uh, what I somehow, to be honest, it makes a noise in a not in a good way, uh, like this comparison between order and disorder, like because I feel it's a very stereotypical, very already, you know, form of understanding the world of like what is the order and what is chaotic and very being very, I mean, which I think in some ways it, um, it is not really what you intend to say, or like because of this other understanding of the world that is not rational, that it's like more emotional and so on. But I feel like with this distinction between order and disorder, and you know, and like, like that distinction in itself, it's very Western in a way and very, you know, and so I, I wonder why you are wanting to continue this, yes. All right, I'll leave it to you to respond. Uh, Malik, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, so maybe, I'll, yeah, maybe I'll just quickly reply to. Is it is it Frida? I think it's Frida, um, and I think they kind of is related to what uh, I'm not sure who the, the previous speaker was, but. I mean, for me, um, uh, the distinction is uh, definitely very clear. <laughs> it's not a shy distinction. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, when I initially became obsessed with a binary, it was, I think, maybe coming from a similar place that I think you're coming from, it was more critical and I saw it as a, a function of 
uh, a colonial kind of thinking, you know, philosophically they talk about what's it, the Cartesian, what, what, and you know, the binary and this, that. And I think that's what you're referring to, to a kind of Western thinking. Um, so I did initially look at it very critically, but I didn't, I was obsessed with it for a long time and I didn't understand why. And eventually I realized, um, it, and I, I read a, a piece of text earlier, but it's, it's basically a kind of metaphorical description of the beginning of the universe. In other words, it's like a myth of the creation of the universe. And it says that in the beginning, these forces, uh, the positive and negative, the in, the out, and blah, blah, blah. This, this is the process of creation. And so every, everything, all the being that happens now, and being is itself creativity, is just a con continuation of the original creativity. And it's, it's a continuation of the original loop. Um, so that's when it became clear to me that it, it, it's, it's, it, the obsession was about the, the dance that's already happening under my body. I, I can choose to manifest it and I flow with it and I move with it and I go with it and it just starts to come out and it goes, you see, it just goes, it comes out. It's there already. I just have to choose to activate it. So for me, that, that duality is very clear, very clear. But in a, in a, from a different perspective, it's also, you know, you throw that away because what it means is that you can never really arrive in one place. You can never really choose chaos or order, whether you like it or not, because this is it. It's the loop. It's the loop. It's, it's unfolding, whether you see it or you don't. Or it's, you see? So what it means is that they, they, you, you can easily say there is no or there is no chaos. Oh, what, what is the difference? Because there is no order without the chaos, which means that really the order is the chaos and the chaos is the order. You, you know, and so it, what, what, what duality means is actually the same thing as non-duality, which is a contradictory thing to say, but I think you, you get me. We're working with uh, lots of contradictions. And then we say that there's no such thing as a contradiction, which is a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction if you believe there's no contradiction. You know, so duality is the same thing as non-duality, just like chaos is the same thing as order. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if, if, you know, the Cartesian stuff means the same thing. I'm not sure, but that's kind of how I see it, you know, and there's really no difference. You can, you can call it Western, you can call it, you know what I'm saying? For me, this shit is just dancing and you, you don't have to know. It doesn't even care what you know, you know, but you know that it's dancing. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, and I, I don't know if it also responds to Sanili Siwe a little bit as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd also like to. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Frida, for 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 the the challenging engagement too, because um, in the beginning of of of, of um, my portion of the talk, I said everything happens in space and time, and I think um that was important for me to premise it that way because all concepts and thus all words have come from our historical epistemies of how we engage with the, re the world, quote unquote reality. And we've come up with terms that attempt to distill our understanding of the patterns of the world. So if, if, if the reason I still choose to use these terms is one, they're familiar. Um, you know, when people say order and chaos, these are words that are now distinguishably recognizable because of history, colonialism and all of that. 
And I think we can play to the advantage of that, where there are words which have room for us to play with them a whole lot more. The word order is kind of etymological root, ordos, rule. You know, it means measure, it means things that we can measure precisely to a kind of consistent place. And chaos, which comes from more of a Greek place of the abyss, that which we sink in, that which we, has no beginning or ending, you know? Um, so I think from, from that perspective, using the word order and chaos or order and disorder is also part of engaging with this idea of the previous dominant idea what that was that all life can be logically concluded and consistently understood. Um, and the importance of being activists for the disorder that is also present in the world and using the word disorder is because it, it's saying that if order is prediction, if order is security within regularity, then disorder is the insecurity. It's the, it's the irregular, it's not being able to predict. And taking what was once rejected as um, that which can't be, couldn't be, and embracing it as very much that which is, which we feel and is present to us in our senses and in the way that we live and we exist, um, is an important thing to do politically as far as how language is used. It's like there are certain words which may have, which may have had a context of derision and made it used in a way to dismiss something. And when we look at those words, I think it's important to us, do they still have some life in them for us to have new conversations with them, for us to continue using them? So it, it goes beyond the words order and disorder. It's like how, you know, some women are able to claim the word bitch and use it in a positive light. And whether you agree with that or not, it questions this whole idea that within the word in and of itself is a limitation um, that you, we can imbibe with inwards new life for us to perceive new, new frontiers and how we perceive this concept, how we relate to it and how it ultimately trickles into how we live and, and perceive. So again, in dealing with this cult of order, this cult of consistency, this cult of coherency, it's important for me to access that language, to talk in the terms of order and make an argument for disorder in the terms of order um, so that we're able to do something with disorder. Because again, the cult of order emphasizes what we're able to do with things. What do you do with the mad person? Do you put them in an institution slash prison or do you find a way to coexist? What do you do with unexpected viruses, contagions, political upshifts, revolutions? How do we deal with unexpected climaxes in life? Uh, this is what this all boils down to. It boils down to how we deal with each other. And I think if we come on the terms that have been previously established and work with that, we have more room to kind of be understood, be legible within the context of what most people know. Because again, it's like, I could easily just redefine and use many other concepts that exist from the wide array of cultures that encapsulate this whole idea of embracing the unknown. But saying disorder, saying chaos is important because it puts it in the conversations of what people already know. It directly um, brings itself into dialogue with the dominant prevalent idea of order as the and only and fundamental way. So I think um, there's a, I, I liken it to lastly, you know, there's a, there's a proverb that says sometimes the only way to remove a thorn from your foot is by using another thorn. Um, so for me, some of these words are thorns in and of themselves, um, but to kind of take out these other thorns in our foot, these discomforting aspects of how we make perceiving the world in a way which makes it more difficult than it could be. Um, it becomes a play of, 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 of that's worth going into, saying the very same thing that we perceive as the problem can be potentially used as a solution. I don't know if I'm making sense or if that even matters. <laughs> So 
Sorry, thank you. No, I, I hear both of you and I, I understand the vibe of duality and like it growing and the, the world moving and that that's not my issue. Like the thing is, I feel that it's like powers in itself have a history and have like have power within themselves, right? And I think it's important to be cautious of which words sometimes get activated or, or to be conscious of what history is behind certain words, because I think for sure it's not the same creation and destruction to, to order and disorder, and even it's not the same disorder and chaos, right? So for me, I think it's interesting, especially when politically, like the notion of disorder and order is so, so used and so instrumentalized to create like segregation to continue like you know like all the things that somehow we don't want and mm -hmm. and i think it's important to be conscious of like the the history and the power of words and the etymology of themselves you know and in that sense i find it tricky or it, it makes it noisy for me the notion of order and disorder as the the principal axis to talk about this but that's that's my feeling, and I just felt like telling you guys. But of course, I yeah. And I don't know if you read this book, uh, "Breathing: Chaos and Poetry" by Franco Bifo Berardi, who's basically talking about this and might be interesting for you guys. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Frida. Maybe, maybe you can type the name in in the chat, Frida. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Frida. Can I listen to Hi, sorry, I just realized I was mute. <laughs> um, what I wanted to say was, okay, to what Frida's saying about things um, in and of themselves having particular meaning and how it is that that affects the conversation. I think it also might be necessary on a level to use the very same words, even though it's also incredibly important to create our own um, words to use with it. The reason for that is because um, when we, like what you was, like what Vero was saying about the thorn, you know, using a thorn to, to, to renegotiate um, comfort with another thorn or re the removal thereof. Um, a lot of people, like a lot of things have to be kind of grounded on a level, just like we are in space and time, um, have to be grounded in, 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 a, in a language of understanding that, that is kind of known, or if not, we need to be able to explain these unknowns to people that exist in this um, idea of, like in the different ideas that are used um, in order to kind of, negotiate understanding. And so anyway, um, that's what I was I wanted to say about that is that I, I get the necessity for them to be used because of the fact that um, in explaining something new, there kind of needs to be a, a baseline, you know, a margin of sorts. Um, and it helps, it helps kind of maneuver where we are, like what she was saying about how chaos and and disorder are words that tend to mean the same thing, but how their inflictions are different based off of um, the definitions, which is the commentary on the meaning and so forth. Um, so yeah, um, I do appreciate that we're using words that are that are based in, in other things we can kind of pick up, read about, engage with, um, even though, and, and kind of renegotiating their, their usage rather, you know? Um, I do appreciate that because it makes it easier for us to kind of engage. And then I also wanted to speak on the how, you know, how we deal with, with said things. And there are different cultures um, in South Africa and the world that decide to deal with, with the idea of madness um, in, in different ways, you know. Um, I do know that it's not really it madness is often seen as something that is an indicator of something that is beyond the now you know the here 
Um, and therefore, a lot of people who are considered mad will be taken to a space, but that space won't be to try and madden them. But it will, it will rather be a space where their madness is given, I guess, form through the understanding of the rhythm of their specific madness. So for instance, Ubungoma or Bukecha is, is one of those um, said spaces where they take something that presents itself as madness. And the, uh, the idea is to put them in a space around people that are also mad, but maybe mad in different ways and to, to help them through the group practice of, um, through ordered rather, um, practices kind of ne negotiate and investigate the madness so that one can find the rhythm with which they can move in their madness through the universe and therefore kind of engage with what is seen as sanity in ways that are compassionate, you know, and that can kind of lead to more harmony. And I guess that's the point for me, you know, for me, it has to do with um, how do we, how do we allow everything that is to exist without kind of necessarily doing too much damage to everything else that is, you know what I mean? Um, because everything has a right to be um, in its, in all of its madness and, and order, you know, um, but it's what, what I find incredibly striking is that it's normally you'll find in specific spaces, like for instance, you're speaking over you speaking about meditation and how in some cultures they'll use like um, meditation to kind of access the the void, the all, the 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 chaos, the the madness just beyond, you know. Um, but but for me, what's interesting is that when you order everything else you allow for a safe space for the chaos to be. And when you allow for chaos to be, there's a specific order that kind of happens in like organically, you know what I mean? Um, and, and it goes back to then the conversation of how order and chaos are things that don't, don't only happen in the same space, but need one another in order to be able to kind of create and, and progress life you know because like the stream analogy um everything is still in many ways like it was yet everything is so different still and it's how we negotiate the the differences and and the similarities has to do with each of our own personal contexts but all of those contexts um are, are derived from an ancient understanding and a modern interaction and engagement you know so yeah i think that's what i want to say <laughs> cool thanks Annelise. i guess there's a there's a method to the madness um so i think we're going to give um uh, uh malik and viewe the last word and then we close um but yeah please go ahead right um yeah go ahead man Okay, thanks. I, I want to I, I want to point out a very beautiful, subtle um, irony, maybe even a contradiction um, in kind of championing chaos and disorder and by shining the light on our cult of, of consistency and order is that, as I said previously, it, it, the, the cult of, of order seeks to reject all things which cannot be ordered. Um, so one would then say, aren't I, aren't we by making room and kind of uh, speaking in and on disorder in a way rejecting order or maybe rejecting the cult of order? Are we saying this is something that shouldn't have happened? This is something that can't go down like this? And I think um, that's not the case. I think what living organisms actively, creatively go through as they move through the motions 
is this um, this notion of evolution. Some can call it optimization of kind of looking at the best possible ways of doing something. And best, quote unquote, would look at the outcome based approach in how things turn out, but also how they feel in the immediate moment, whether they promote a sense of coexistency, do they make it difficult for us to engage with each other as a whole? Um, and I think by talking to the unspeakable, by trying to, 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 to explain the inexplicable, uh, at least what I'm trying to do is say, everything has a right to exist. And in this context of existing, there's, there's, there's variables and there's variations of how things could turn out. And the beautiful thing about history is we're able to retrospectively look at what we've already tried and what we're still, or what we're still consistently putting into play. And we're able to try something else. We're able to play around. We might have lost we were there. Yeah. Um, maybe Malik, you, you yeah. go for it while we wait. Sure, sure. Let's just, um, yeah, I, I really like what you said about, about integrating the one into the other, you know, because, yeah, when there's chaos, how do, how do we deal with it and how do we maintain you know what we're on uh you know they they you know they need each other like you say so it should not be a matter of the one compromises the other the one kills the other it's not a it's not a battle to the death it's a dance for life it's a dance for the continuity of it it's not about the one beating the other and taking over so yeah, I mean, I, I think about that particular issue a lot of how to integrate them, how to make it work. It's a, it's a very fun uh, social experiment that I'm constantly engaged in. Um, because for me to unleash what we might describe as chaos, or for me, uh, musically, uh, spiritually, vibically, it, it's, uh, a, it's, it's an expression of freedom. Maybe that's a different word, you know? And that activity um, is something that I'm a little bit addicted to, you know? It's calling me all the time. And so I look for opportunities to unleash, you know? And when I go to get a good chance, you know, when the vibes are really right, then I unleash. And that's the good shit. And, if I could choose it, I might just choose to stay. <laughs> you know what I mean? But there's always that thing of reel it back in, come back down. And this is now when I talk to you nicely and I'm polite and I greet and I say hello and you know, we send the nice emails and da, 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 da. all the human stuff, the everyday stuff, the normal stuff, it's an act, you know? It's an act, I'm just keeping it under wraps. <laughs> You know, and then I need to get another chance to unleash. So it's an addiction, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, but it's something that I'm called to do. And so I have to find a way to integrate it into the world in a way where I can express it some way, somehow. Um, and, and it's interesting, like I say, it's a social experiment to see what it means to do it in this way, in that way. And, like you mentioned, there are different avenues for these kind of things culturally. There are things that are done, you know, people trust and so on. But yeah, yeah, I, I'm. I want to see where this goes. <laughs> Let's yeah. see how far we can push it. Um, but yeah, and so I see viewers not coming back. Before we close, I wondered if I could maybe request that I just have a weird itch that there might be maybe like one little somebody someone with the itching little question that they shy but they really know they want to ask you know maybe we can give that person an opportunity we'll give you like 20 seconds of silence and 
And maybe someone's going to come through. Just one more opportunity. No force, no fire. If it's not, then we go home. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. I see a hand. I see an itching hand. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you for scratching my itch. I just want, on the, on the notion of the explicable history, dance of life, can you talk a little bit about the madness into music and the music into madness? Yeah, I mean, my best reference for, for that, and I, I mentioned now, is, is that feeling of freedom. And I think, yeah, my best reference for it is what they call free music. It's free, it's free jazz uh, or free music, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think music is one of the ways, which is, it's another universal cultural artifact. It's, a, it's another universal human mechanism. And, you know, with very good reason, music is that space which we've developed as human beings. It's, I think, our, our most successful technology um, functioning at the level of the, 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 the unconscious, or at least it's tickling, like they were saying, it's alluding to. You know, it can't quite get there, but it's in the poetry. It's our deepest poetry is music, and music in the sense of sound, because poetry is still operating with semiotics, words, semiotic meaning, as opposed to the meaning, which is a kind of vibrational meaning in sound, which you don't understand it like one, two, three, A, B, C, but it hits you, and you don't really know that it's telling your body that it must stand up and dance, but your body does it automatically, but you think you're doing it, but no, it's the sound spoke and the body, you know, it can understand in a way that you can't understand. So yeah, music is our most successful technology, our deepest technology to, to for life and getting by and survival and processing all of this. And also to express the necessary chaos, the necessary freedom, the necessary change, the necessary spontaneity, the, the nowness of everything that is here. Uh, what's that new film that everything here, everywhere, all at once, blah, 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 that thing. Um, yeah, so music, I mean, music is, you know, music is the one. I see viewers back. Yeah. The order, chaos, y'all, it's all happening. <laughs> Excuse me for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've returned you wanna though. Up, um, I, you want to pick up where you were, what, what you were saying? Yeah, I can. I can kind of just conclude it. My thing is, I really hope people aren't going to take away from this conversation the notion that the very same way in which the culture, the cult of order, rejected disorder. Now disorder needs to have its turn, you know, um, or that there isn't any, or that we did anything wrong in the first place by kind of holding on to order in that compulsive way. It happened in the way that it did, and we learn through the trials and the errors, you know. And I think what nature teaches us is this constant learning and expanding. So I was alluding to this idea of evolution and growth and optimization, and how we're able to say what we're saying right now in the present moment, uh, but very much based on things that have been happening in hindsight. So we're able to go back and look at what has already occurred in the existence of this universe as we know it and as we're able to feel it, and we move from there. So that, 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 that being our reference point, we're able to negotiate out of all the possibilities that we can keep trying. Um, the most optimal or that which we feel is optimal in the space and room of universal engagement and, 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 the, and the politics of that. So I think this emphasis on embracing disorder and chaos and making room for traditions and technologies that embrace the disorder doesn't in any way imply that nothing, any, anything wrong was done to begin with, but it says naturally we're growing and perhaps uh, if we look at 
the aspects of what have occurred through our strong compulsion in order, this in itself begs us to take a deeper look at disorder. So again, it's transactional. It, um, it, this is not a moral argument. This is not a, an argument that attempts to split between the two. It's, it's a reconciliation. It's how do we work with what we have to create the, 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 the most harmonious outcome. And even the harmony is something that we feel as we move on because yesterday's harmony might be today's chaos, you know? Uh, we might learn, we learn as we go along and the, the solutions we come up with today, I think are definitely prob tomorrow's problems. And it's in that spirit that this engagement takes place. Not to say that anything that has happened should have never happened or still shouldn't happen, but it's in saying that if what we want to do is recreate patterns that are going to develop us, then perhaps we need to look at um, other angles and other variations within how cosmic order manifests itself. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Can I can I add one thing there? Go you? ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I I kind of I wanted to quickly just come back to the thing of almost like a war between chaos and order. Uh, which it isn't. Um, we're not, the one is not trying to kill the other, but um, you mentioned something, Vera, about, you know, it's, it's our turn now. And, you know, really how I see it is like, some people might be annoyed and say, you know, you know, the summary of this conversation is you should have a balance between chaos and order. That's the point. One sentence, you know, but uh, I, I think who's going to say there should be a balance between chaos and order? No, come on. Yeah, you, what do you, are you the boss? No one is the boss, you know. Whether you like it or not, there will be a balance between chaos and order, you know. And this thing is happening, baby. This thing is right. happening. And you know, your time might not be now. It might be in a hundred years. It might be in a million years. I mean, time is going. It's going. You know, but one day this is gonna sweep on the other side, and it's gonna come back. You know what I'm saying? You don't. You, you don't have a choice, man. You know, balance, you don't find balance. Balance will find you. Mm. You get it? <laughs> if you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't get it. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 yeah, we, 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 we allow it. And, and maybe this war thing, you know, whether I like it or not, I, it might be the case, at least for the time being, I'm on the side, let's say it's, it's a war, you know, just picture a movie and this chaos is one nation and order is one nation and it's really a war. And you know, these wars that go over like so many years and it's a long war and I'm a warrior for chaos and uh, I'm gonna fight for chaos and you know, um, you know and, and maybe that's just what I have to do because chaos is the underdog right now and he has to get back, you know, we just, we just um, don't have, uh, we, I mean, we can, we can think that we have responsibility and this is my purpose in life and all, but you know, the thing is taking care of itself. So you just, you just do what you gotta do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a fantastic session. Thank you to both of you. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, the conversation continues. Um, um, Malik, following the, the projects that you're working on, um, and Viwe will be following you as well. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> we love you. <laughs>